and we'll get started. Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. And I am very excited to be here with Jerry Dontremont, who has done, I think this is like maybe the fourth program you've done with us. I believe so. Yeah. Because <laughs> we just can't get enough. We cannot get enough about New England lighthouses and you are such a good speaker. So before I hand it over to Jeremy to do his thing, I want to say a couple of things. One is I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programs. Also, Jeremy allowed us to share this program with other libraries. And, you know, when libraries get together, we just make lighthouse magic. So that's how this program came about um, and a bunch of them. So thanks to everybody who's here from other libraries, as well as Jeremy's fans from all over the world. Um, uh, Jeremy has a a uh, presentation. It's about an hour, maybe a few minutes more with a couple extra clips. But, you know, I just told him we'll listen to anything he has to say. So if you have questions, um, please put them in the Q&A. I will be turning the chat off um, while he's presenting so it's not distracting to people. But you can still chat to me. You just can't chat to everybody. And then I'll turn it back on after the presentation. So Jeremy Dontremont, like I said, one of our very favorite speakers, he knows everything about lighthouses, haunted and otherwise, and he's going to, he's here to talk about New England lighthouses and the people who kept them. And I think it'll be like this interesting history and, oh my gosh, I'm just so excited to have you here, Jeremy. Thanks so much for doing this again with us. Thank you, Mina. It's my pleasure. And I don't know everything about lighthouses. Nobody does. You know, I think it's true with a lot of subjects. The more I get into it, the more I realize I don't know. So <laughs> I've been doing lighthouse stuff for like 40 years, but I, I believe me, I do not know everything. So I guess I'll jump right into screen sharing here because I've got a lot, of, a lot of ground I want to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully you're seeing my screen. We are. All right. Excellent. So <clears throat> I don't want to do an extended introduction here, but I'll just mention, as I've probably said when I've spoken uh, for you before, but uh, I, like I just said, I've been doing lighthouse stuff for, for just about 40 years. I grew up in Lynn, Mass, and you know, always loved the ocean. But then uh, it was really about the 1980s. I got more into lighthouses. I started visiting them, and I fell in love with their beauty. I started photographing them. And like a lot of people, I, I, you know, started going to as many lighthouses as I could. But I also started reading about them and realizing how interesting the human history of lighthouses is, the stories of keepers and their families and so forth, how devoted they were to these places. And those are the two things that have kept me uh, hooked all these years, the, the beauty of lighthouses and the human history. So a quick, a uh, little bit more of an introduction here. Um, a few years ago, I was giving a talk and a guy raised his hand at the end and he said, I, you know, I have no idea why lighthouses were built, why were lighthouses built. So I, I thought, well, I, maybe I should say something about that from now on. So I always explain it just to simplify it, to say that there's signposts on the sea, meaning, uh, you know, if you're in a car and you're driving down the road and you see signs, they tell you where you are and or, and or where you're going. Uh, lighthouses and buoys and various aids to navigation like that do the same thing on our waterways uh, by recognizing uh, light and the different lighthouses have different characteristics, uh, flashes, colors of the light and so forth. By recognizing those lights and finding them on their nautical charts or electronic charts these days, it helps mariners tell where they are. They can plot their position by seeing these aids to navigation. Uh, in the early days of our country, uh, most lighthouses were built to uh, welcome mariners into harbors or, or bays or the mouths of rivers and that kind of thing. As time went on, they started marking dangerous spots to warn mariners away from dangerous ledges and so forth. Many lighthouses signify both welcome and warning. They might be at the entrance to a harbor, but also uh, mariners know they have to keep their distance and not go aground on the rocks. There are about 850 lighthouses in the U.S. today, uh, depending on how you what you consider an official lighthouse, but about 850 and more than 20,000 in the world. I should update that because I know it's more than 21,000, uh, but uh, it's, you can't give an exact number. Any country that has a coastline and maritime commerce has lighthouses. The Lighthouse Service in this country uh, was established in 1789 under the Treasury Department. Uh, before that, the lighthouses were built and managed by the individual colonies. Uh, and then, so it was under the Treasury Department under uh, Secretary Alexander Hamilton at first, eventually went to the Commerce Department in 1910, and then the Coast Guard took over management of our lighthouses in 1939, 
there will not be a quiz. I don't expect people to remember the dates, but uh, I just wanted to give that background. There were civilian keepers before 1939, Coast Guard keepers after that. About half of the lighthouses still standing in the U.S. are activates in navigation. Uh, I think it's a little bit more than half. Uh, and that I see a typo in there. That should say, obviously, all are now automated. Uh, the lighthouses that are still active are automated, which means we don't have traditional lighthouse keepers living at these places anymore. The days of traditional lighthouse keepers, uh, that's pretty much over in this country and most of the world. Uh, most lighthouses in the world are automated. Here and there, there are, there are lighthouse keepers, but not many. In this country, it's fading into history. And as that's been happening, uh, the Coast Guard has been getting out of the business of uh, taking care of these historic structures. Their budget is stretched very thin. So over the years, uh, lighthouses are being gradually transferred to new stewards. Uh, a lot of times nonprofit organizations, uh, local city or town governments, uh, sometimes state governments, sometimes state parks, uh, national parks, et cetera, and some to private owners. I'll say a little bit more about that tonight. But basically, all these new stewards, uh, these preservation groups and individuals are the keepers of the 21st century. And I'm going to say a little bit more about the job of a keeper before I get into some uh, stories here. Um, this uh, keeper you see in this picture here was Fairfield Moore. He was keeper at the famous Nubble Light in York, Maine. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. Uh, he was there for a few years in the 1920s. And uh, in 1928, his bosses in the Lighthouse Service asked every uh, keeper in the country to write down what they saw as their duties or responsibilities. This is some of what he wrote down. It's not all of it, but uh, I won't read this out loud. But if you read it, you see that most of it has to do with keeping and maintaining that light uh, and uh, keeping the fog signal, which was a fog bell at this time. The light and the fog signal were considered pretty much of equal importance. So as a kerosene lamp in that day, he had to make sure it stayed uh, lighted from sunset to sunrise, no matter what. Uh, he had to have mechanical aptitude. He had to be able to take care of all that equipment. And the fog bell was on a tower. You see the, that old postcard from the early 1900s in the lower right. You see the bell hanging on the side of that building in times of fog, the keeper would go into that shed, he would crank up a mechanism and a hammer would uh, come out of a slot there and hit the bell every so many seconds. And mariners, even if they couldn't see anything, they'd hear that clang of that bell, whether it was twice every 15 seconds or whatever it might, might be, and that would help tell them where they were. This is, of course, before GPS, you know, they didn't really have anything better than that. So uh, Bell was super important, had to maintain all that equipment, had to keep the buildings pristine, everything had to be painted. Uh, the uh, inside the keeper's house had to be in perfect order. Obviously, in places that were family stations, like Nubble Light was, where keepers lived with their families, families pitched in. The wives uh, obviously did a tremendous amount of the work, although they were usually not paid for it. And the kids would have duties like polishing the brass and things like that. Some family stations also had animals like cows and chickens, and the kids usually helped with that as well. So... Um, a woman asked me a few years ago, what was the job of the lighthouse keeper? Did he switch a light on and go to bed and switch the light off in the morning? Was that the job? And it was a little more complicated than that. A lot of paperwork as well, keeping daily logs and so forth, et cetera, et cetera. It's really a lot. So I'm going to talk about Boston Light uh, for a while here. The first light station on the North American continent. And here's a map showing its location. It's in outer Boston Harbor. And you can see on this map that it's uh, actually closer to the town of Hull on the South Shore uh, than it is to Boston itself. And for many, many years, actually for a couple of hundred years, just about all the, all the uh, traffic, the uh, maritime traffic coming into Boston went between Boston Light and the town of Hull. Boston Light is on Little Brewster Island, a small island that's the southernmost of that group of islands called the Brewsters in Outer Boston Harbor. Uh, and uh, it, as I said, it was the first lighthouse on the continent. Here's an early drawing. It was established on uh, September 14th, 1716. Boston obviously was an important port in early America or the early colonies. Uh, a lot of trade going on by this time and fishing and shipbuilding and all kinds of things. The merchants of Boston pretty much demanded a lighthouse. There was a petition and the colonial government agreed to build a lighthouse. So uh, September 1716, it was a 50 foot stone tower uh, originally lighted with spermaceti candles from the sperm whale. 
eventually went to uh, whale oil lamps, and eventually in the mid-1800s to kerosene, and then electricity, of course. But anyway, so uh, the first keeper hired to be the first lighthouse keeper on the continent was a guy named George Worthy Lake. He was a local man, 43 years old at the time. He had a farm on one of the other Boston Harbor Islands, moved to the island with his wife and two daughters, two youngest of their five children, along with a family servant and two slaves. There were two uh, African uh, slaves, a man named Shadwell and a woman named Dinah. Sadly, we know virtually nothing about them. Uh, I'm sure they did a lot of the work. Uh, Worthy Lake was paid very little by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, by the, the colony. Uh, so he had to do extra things to support his family. He served as a harbor pilot. He would lead vessels into the harbor in his boat and uh, got, got extra money for that. He also, for a while, tried having a flock of sheep. But one day his flock of, if I remember right, I think it was... Uh, 79 sheep. I'm not sure I remember that right. But anyway, a large flock of sheep. And one day at low tide, they wandered out on a sand spit away from the island. And you can, I'm sure, guess what happened when the tide came in. Unfortunately, that was the end of his flock of sheep. So his sheep had very bad luck and, and Worthy Lake had bad luck. Uh, in November of 1718, Worthy Lake went into Boston to collect his pay. This drawing's from a little bit uh, uh, a little bit later than that, but that uh, vessel you see there was a sloop and it was probably similar to the one uh, they used to go to Boston. They went in on a Sunday, he and his wife and one of their two daughters and the family servant, they attended church on Sunday in Boston, stayed overnight. He picked up his pay the next morning and they were traveling back to Boston Light. Uh, they picked up a friend at another island and then they anchored off of Boston Light in this in a sloop. Shadwell, the slave, paddled a canoe out to meet the landing party. From all accounts, there was no storm. There weren't big waves or anything. But for whatever reason, uh, as uh, Shadwell was paddling the canoe back to the island, the canoe capsized and all six people drowned uh, who were aboard. It was probably overcrowded. It was also it was November, so the water was very cold and they probably didn't know how to swim very well. Uh, and uh, it was big, big news, obviously, of its day. And to this day, I believe it's tied for the worst lighthouse tragedy in American history as far as loss of life. There were six people who died at a lighthouse in Florida in a hurricane in the 1800s. But as I said, sp six people died in this accident. This is the triple gravestone in George, of George Ann and uh, George Ann and Ruth Worthy Lake uh, in the Copse Hill burying grounds in the north end of Boston. Cotton Mather, the famous minister in Boston, preached a sermon about this. Ben Franklin, 12 years old at the time and living in Boston, wrote a poem called The Lighthouse Tragedy based on this. His brother printed copies and young Ben Franklin sold copies of his poem on the streets of Boston. Uh, one other uh, interesting footnote is that uh, the stonecutter who carved this gravestone subsequently married the Worthy Lake's surviving daughter, which is uh, at least something good came out of the whole thing. And one more footnote that's not so uh, positive is that the next keeper who came out to Boston Light, his name was Robert Saunders. He also drowned about three days after taking the job. And uh, what happened was he and two friends went out in a boat to meet an incoming ship. The boat capsized and two out of the three drowned. So people started to wonder if the island was cursed, uh, but nobody died again, no keepers or anything until a young Coast Guardsman drowned in an accident in the early 1950s. So uh, if, you, if there's a, an offshore lighthouse with a long history, usually you'll find some tragedies in there somewhere. So jumping to the American Revolution, it was the scene of fighting a couple of times uh, during the time that the British occupied Boston Harbor. Uh, and then the last thing that the English forces did when they were leaving the harbor after occupying it in 1776, spring of 1776, as they were leaving, they set a timed charge on the island and they blew up the lighthouse uh, so it couldn't be used by the, the colonists. Uh, and there was no lighthouse until 1783. It was rebuilt by order of Governor John Hancock. And the lighthouse we have today, built in 1783, uh, a few years ago, they were doing a, a restoration. They removed all the coatings from the outside and it was found that the lower approximately 15 feet of the lighthouse 
had very different, much smaller stones arranged very differently. It's believed that the lower part of the lighthouse is left over from that 1716 lighthouse. So at least some of that first tower appears to be incorporated into the new one. So jumping ahead uh, quite a few years uh, for the interest of time here, I could talk all night about Boston Light, but uh, this guy in this picture is uh, Maurice Babcock, who was the uh, principal keeper at Boston Light, 1926 to 41. Uh, and uh, he was from Maine, had a long career in the lighthouse service. And in this picture, he's inside the lens at Boston Light. That is still there, that lens, installed in 1859 and still in use there. It's a rotating, what's called a Fresnel, F-R-E-S-N-E-L, after Augustin Fresnel in France, who invented them in the 1820s, a Fresnel lens. And this one is a second order, which means the second from the largest and most powerful lens that they made. The glass prisms serve to magnify and focus the light into a, a powerful horizontal beam. Uh, a lens like this would have produced a light that was visible well over 20 miles out to sea on a clear night. Uh, and this one rotates, so those round panels create a flash as that rotates around the uh, the light. That's a kerosene lamp that he's fiddling with there, uh, very finicky, called an incandescent oil vapor lamp. Uh, Maurice Babcock, like a lot of lighthouse keepers, was very, uh, let's say, reticent to talk about uh, the, the job he did. He certainly didn't see himself as a hero. There were very matter of fact about it, about you know keeping that light lit no matter what from sunset to sunrise keeping the fog signal going. In 1934, there was a, a historical society gathering on the island. They asked him to make a speech, and the, the words on the screen here, that's his entire speech that he made. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not much of an orator, but I enjoy keeping the light burning for the ships coming in and the fog signal sounding. I thank you. End of speech. To him, there was nothing more to say. That pretty much says it all. I interviewed his son, Maurice Jr., in the 1980s, he told me that uh, he enjoyed his early life on the island. At that time, it's hard to believe, but in the 1930s and early 40s, there were two keepers' houses on the island at that time, three families, a principal keeper and two assistant keepers, and as many as 19 kids. And I haven't mentioned that Boston Light, Little Brewster Island is the name of the island. It's only maybe two acres at the most. So imagine 19 kids living on a two-acre island <laughs> with three houses. Maurice Babcock Jr. said that they got along pretty much, but he said it was kind of territorial. And one time he went on to the Norwood family's part of the island. They had nine kids and one of the Norwood girls socked him in the nose. So he learned to uh, ask permission after that. He said they liked to play baseball, but the island was too small. So they would go to Great Brewster Island next door but the ball was still going in the water a lot. The uh, In the water was out, and the games didn't last very long. But you basically made your own fun at these places. This is uh, Ralph Norwood and his wife, Josephine. He was an assistant keeper under Babcock for a few years, and then he became the head keeper. And when the Coast Guard took over the lighthouses in 1939, the keepers were given the option of joining the Coast Guard or not, or remaining civilian until they retired. Norwood was a civilian, but he joined the Coast Guard, so he's wearing a Coast Guard uniform here. So he was the, the first Coast Guard keeper of Boston Light. He and his wife, Josephine, had nine kids. You see them to the right. That's a little bit later at a lighthouse in Maine. Uh, and uh, they had all nine kids before Josephine was 30, which is amazing in itself. And But she lived to be 100. She died not that many years ago at 100. I interviewed her and some of the Norwood siblings uh, in the uh, early 1990s. They told me they really loved their time there. They pretty much lived there in the summer. Uh, during the school year, they would board with families either in Hull or Winthrop to the north. Uh, and uh, so they could attend school. They would go out uh, to the island on school vacations and, of course, for the summer maybe sometimes on weekends, but the summer was really their favorite time. They would uh, do a lot of boating, of course, and fishing and shell fishing. They'd have pie eating contests with kids on neighboring islands and rowboat races and so forth. They'd explore ruins of old houses on the islands and old forts and things. And, you know, again, they, they, you had to make your own fun in a place like this. I don't know how many kids would put up with it now <laughs> with no TV or cell phone or anything else, but they, they, they definitely, uh, made their own fun. Uh, this is Ralph Norwood again, inside the lens at Boston Light. And I'm going to play you a sound clip. In the uh, 1980s, 
His grandson, Willie Emerson, wrote a book about his family's life at Boston Light, self-published it. It's called First Light. And he interviewed his grandfather, Ralph, on audio tape. And he was asked, what are the duties of a keeper? I'm going to play what he said. The words are on the screen because it's a little hard to understand everything he says. But let me go ahead and play it. All our jobs were doing carpenter work, shingling roofs, painting, painting. We had to paint all the buildings and whitewash the tower and whitewash the signal house and, and run the fog signal. And had to stay awake all night, of course. Somebody had to be awake all night to see that the light didn't go out or had any trouble with it. And if we came in fog, we had to stop the fog signal from going. Oh, it was a working job, just like any other job. <laughs> he was from Maine, in case you couldn't tell. I always loved the way he says, oh, it was a working job, just like any other job. You know, again, very matter of fact about the work that they did. Certainly didn't see himself as any kind of a hero. But to me, lighthouse keepers were heroes in, in many ways. Uh, this is Georgia Norwood, the first child born on the island, born to, uh, to uh, Ralph and Josephine in uh, 1939. I'm sorry, 1932, 1932, April 1932. The story goes that uh, Josephine went into labor or appeared to go into labor. So a doctor was called from the town of Hull uh, and uh, the doctor got somebody to take him out in a boat. And uh, it was very rough seas that night. There was a storm going on. So they went out uh, in the dark in the storm, tried to land the boat at Little Brewster Island. They couldn't land. They had to turn around and go back to Hull. Meanwhile, it turned out to be false labor. Uh, Georgia wasn't born until a week later in calm weather, but because the doctor had, got, had gone out in the storm, she got the nickname Storm Child. And a novelist named Ruth Carmen decided to write a novel called Storm Child. You see the cover there. And I guess it was fairly popular. If you ever find a copy, it's fun to read. Do not take it as a history book because the only true thing is that she was born on the island. Everything else is made up, including the tidal wave destroying Boston Light at the end of the book. But anyway, so uh, this book was popular. Some people in Hollywood they could, thought it would make a good movie. A screenplay was written about Storm Child, and Georgia was going to play herself in the movie. She was five years old. The picture on the left was a publicity picture for the movie that was going to be made. So she's five in that picture. Of course, the middle picture is her with her father, Keeper Ralph. But uh, they were going to make this movie. Uh, they, uh, the story is that on the night before Georgia was going to fly out to California, uh, she was crying. She went to her parents and she said, I don't want to go to Hollywood. I want to stay at Boston Light. So they thought better of it. They uh, didn't send her to, to Hollywood. The movie was never made, uh, which I think is kind of sad. I understand why they felt that way, but uh, I, I'm kind of sorry we don't get to see the movie uh, Storm Child. Uh, I guess they couldn't afford Shirley Temple <laughs> to play the role. They, when they were publicizing it, uh, when it was, uh, they thought the movie was going to be made. She was called the Bay State's own Shirley Temple. So jumping ahead to the late 1980s, Boston Light. Um, well. Let me hold the thought I was starting to say there. This is Dennis Dever, uh, who was the Coast Guard officer in charge in the late 1980s. I lived in Winthrop, Mass. at the time, and I got involved with friends of the Boston Harbor Islands. I was helping to give tours of Boston Light, and I got to know Dennis, and I interviewed him at the top of the lighthouse. And uh, there's that same lens in this picture here. So let me play you a little uh, audio clip of Dennis Dever in uh, the summer of 1989. Uh, it's a nice environment uh, in the evening when the wind's howling, the snow's flying, and the, the sea's roaring against the, the rocks outside your window just to sit there uh, in the living room, maybe read a Edgar Allan Poe book or something like that. That's what I enjoy doing. <laughs> Dennis loved being a lighthouse keeper, and he loved a good storm out there. And it looked like he was going to be the last lighthouse keeper in the country uh, because Boston Light was due to be automated and de-staffed by 1990. It was going to be the last lighthouse in the country to be automated and to have the Coast Guard's uh, staff removed. As it turned out, uh, people thought the place would fall to ruin if nobody was living there. So there was legislation passed in October 89, led by Senator Ted Kennedy, and uh, money was put in the Coast Guard budget to keep keepers there. So for some years after that, they had still had Coast Guard keepers on the island. But then a little over 20 years ago, they decided, well, we have other things for these Coast Guard personnel to be doing. And they hired a civilian keeper to be on the island. 
And this is Sally Snowman, who was the civilian keeper for 20 years. Uh, I, I know Sally very well. I knew her before she was a lighthouse keeper. She was in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Uh, I met her when I was giving tours out there. But anyway, uh, she just retired at the end of December, at the end of 2023, as the last official lighthouse keeper in the country still employed by the federal government. She was the last one. Uh, in this picture, she is wearing an old-fashioned dress. She made those herself, and she, that's how she dressed when she was out there to kind of represent uh, somebody who might have been there in the 1800s. I'm not sure about the colors, if somebody would have worn those colors then. But anyway, Sally uh, was, did a great job out there. Not the traditional job. The light was automatic, but she kept an eye on everything. She supervised volunteers who spent shifts out there. And for quite a while, she ran tours out there. But then uh, there was damage to the piers, and there were no tours in the last few years. But anyway, uh, I'm going to play you a little clip of Sally from the podcast that I do. Uh, this is uh, She's been on the podcast a couple of times. This is from the most recent interview when she was about to retire. I'm going to play you a, about a one-minute clip here. Here it is. It is magical. I just love being out there with the ocean around me, all around me, just listening, closing my eyes and hearing what's happening all around, the, the wind whipping around the tower or what have you. And it's all nature stuff that um, that's pulling at my heartstrings right now. Waking up in the morning and greeting the sun and then bring closure at night. And it's just not that way in Weymouth, Massachusetts. I look out of my bedroom window and I can see the sunset behind the trees, but you can't see it actually going down. Boston, eight miles away, is just dropping behind the city. And, and then the sun rises, it's coming right over the Atlantic Ocean with no obstruction whatsoever. It is a really special place. I got to spend one night at Boston Light. She invited me to sleep on the couch in the uh, keeper's house. And uh, I got to be there for sunset and sunrise, which was pretty incredible. And she, of course, she got to be there as a regular thing. So I just want to mention that Boston Light, even though it was the first one to be established, the first lighthouse to be established in 1716, because it was destroyed by the British in the Revolution and rebuilt, it's not the oldest standing lighthouse tower. This is. This is Sandy Hook Light at the entrance to New York Harbor in New Jersey, the end of a long peninsula. Uh, built in 1764, and it's still the first tower that survives there. Uh, it's another one that they would call is known as a rubble stone tower, just from a uh, stone that was found nearby there. Uh, and it is open for for tours there, and it's got another beautiful Fresnel lens at the top. So that is the oldest standing lighthouse in the country. The keeper's house there, you see, it came quite a bit later. Uh, the, there were 11 light stations established in the American colonies before the revolution. The last light station to be established in the colonies was the Thatcher Island Twin Lights off the east coast of Cape Ann uh, near Rockport, Massachusetts. And originally, they built two short lighthouses. And by the way, they put two lighthouses in some places so they could be easily differentiated from single lights nearby. In the early days, they didn't have great ways of making different flashes and stuff. So they would put two lights at some places just to differentiate them. Thatcher Island originally had uh, two short lighthouses, but then uh, in uh, around 1860, they decided they wanted them to be seen farther. That was considered a very important light station. So they built these two beautiful 124-foot granite towers in 1861. They built them using New Hampshire granite, which was like an insult to local people because Rockport and Cape Ann were famous for quarries, for granite quarries. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure why they use New Hampshire granite, except uh, I, I think maybe they didn't have to pay sales tax. <laughs> so I don't know. I can't tell if anybody's laughing. Hopefully, you know, that's a joke. I guess they just got a better buy in New Hampshire granite. And this is a, a guy who was a keeper at Thatcher Island in the early 1900s, George Keezer. This picture was given to me by his uh, late granddaughter, Barbara Keezer. And he's pretending to scold his little son there. And the one in the background, the little toddler there, was another son. That's Thatcher Warren Keezer. He was actually named for the island. He was born on the island. Uh, George Keezer's wife in 1901 uh, went into labor during a storm. That seems to be a, a common theme. And George uh, took his rowboat to the mainland about a mile away to get a doctor. 
and it, the seas were very rough. So he got the doctor and paddled his or rowed his way back to the island. And they say that it took him so long to get the doctor and get back to the island that by the time he got back, little Thatcher was out on the dock waving to him. So that may be an exaggeration, but it's a good story. All right, so this is a, a phrase traditionally used in the French lighthouse service, en fer et paradis, uh, meaning hell and heaven. And it refers to the two extremes of lighthouses. On one hand, you have the en fer or hell lighthouses, which would be uh, a lighthouse out on a rock or a very small island, or some are just sunken down into the seabed and surrounded by water. At those places, uh, it was generally male keepers only without their families. And obviously, there were rough places to live. And they lived at these places all year round. The thing about those places that it could, it was that it could be very dangerous to get on and off the lighthouses. And there were quite a few accidents. There were deaths associated with these places. It was, it was, a da it was dangerous work. And also, you were stuck there for long periods of time, especially in the winter, not being able to get off. You might be there for a couple of months or more at a time just in the lighthouse. And so that job was not for everybody by any means. And then you had on the other end, the other extreme, the paradise stations, which would be a place either on the mainland or a larger island where you had room for uh, one or more separate keepers' houses. Boston Light, even though it's a small island, would have been more of a paradise station. Uh, and the, at those places, the keepers lived with their families. They often had big gardens and cows and chickens and um, almost like small farms in some cases, much more sheltered from the uh, storms and things like that. Still could be dangerous in, in storms, but not like the, uh, the more remote uh, wave-swept offshore lights. And this is probably the most famous unfair type lighthouse in New England, uh, also known as a wave-swept or sea-swept tower. This is Minot's Light or Minot's Ledge Light, which is uh, off of Cohasset and Situate on the south shore on the south approach to southern approach to Boston Harbor. It's a 114-foot granite tower. You can see the Boston skyline and the distance in that photo. The aerial film that you're seeing was taken, I believe, in the 1950s by the late historian Edward Rowe Snow. And I'm going to talk about more about him in a minute. Probably some of you might remember him. Uh, and uh, well, that wave right there goes over the top of the lighthouse. Oh, I see a, I see somebody's uh, commenting with a little heart there. That's nice to see. So moving on here, this, here's uh, a map showing the location, or two maps showing the location of Minot's Light. In uh, 1843, an engineer named I.W.P. Lewis wrote a, a very important report to Congress on the state of our lighthouses. And he said uh, the ledge uh, ledges around there were known as the Cohasset Rocks, were one of the most dangerous part of the coast. There had been more than 40 shipwrecks there in just nine years. Some of them had loss of life. And he said a lighthouse was needed there more than anywhere in New England. Uh, Minot's Ledge is one of a bunch of ledges there, in, uh, what they call the Cohasset Rocks. I see the lower map there. And again, there are many shipwrecks in that area. So in the upper map, you can see how it's near Cohasset and Situate, and it's on the uh, southern approach to Boston Harbor there. Originally, when they were going to build the lighthouse, uh, the Congress appropriated funds in the 18, late 1840s, and people said, "Well, if you're going to build a lighthouse there, you've got to build it. Uh, you've got to build a tall granite tower in the style of Eddie Stone Light and some of the other early wave-swept towers in the British Isles. Uh, Bell Rock Lighthouse in Scotland was another famous one that still stands from 1811. But anyway, uh, Congress did not appropriate enough money to build a lighthouse like that. Uh, just 39,500 were uh, ultimately spent on the first lighthouse." Uh, so it wasn't enough for a granite tower. They hired a, uh, an engineer named Captain William Swift, and this is what he came up with. You see the painting of the first Minot's lighthouse. Uh, and it was 70 feet tall with uh, these uh, pilings, these iron pilings that were drilled down into the rock, topped with a two-floor apartment for the keepers to live in. And I don't know about anybody else. I would not have been uh, very excited or very happy about taking a job as a keeper there. I think I'd be scared out of my whatever. Um, and this was the first keeper there, Isaac Dunham. He was from Bridgewater, Mass. And right from the time he took the job, he told the authorities, uh, you've got to you've got to make this place, uh, you've got to shore it up somehow. You've got to make it uh, stand up better to storms. Because he said, 
when there was a, a bad storm, the lighthouse would sway in each direction, sometimes as much as two feet in each direction, which had to be absolutely terrifying. April 6th, 1850, there was a big storm. He wrote, this is what he wrote in the keeper's log. Wind east blowing very hard with an ugly sea makes the light real like a drunken man. I hope God will in mercy still the raging sea or we must perish. God only knows what the end will be. Isaac's son, Isaac Jr., was an assistant keeper, and there was another assistant keeper. Uh, all three of them made it through some really bad storms, but then in October 1850, all three of them resigned at once because they were afraid they wouldn't live through the storms of winter. I don't blame them one bit. So they all quit. And then the government hired a new head keeper, John Bennett. He was a veteran of the Royal Navy in England. And at first he said, this lighthouse will stand through anything. He said he wasn't afraid of uh, the possibility of it falling over. The idea was that Swift and also Bennett felt uh, that waves would just sweep right through those legs and not do any damage. Well, anyway, in early eight, April 1851, excuse me, I need to cough for a second here. Oh, excuse me. So uh, early April 1851, there was a big storm and it washed away the station's boat. Uh, Bennett went into Boston to get a new boat. He left two young assistant keepers in charge of the lighthouse. They're both in their 20s. Uh, Joseph Wilson was from England. Joseph Antoine was from Portugal. And uh, he left them with no boat. There was no choice. They only had the one boat. So these two young guys are out there with no boat. A another storm came into the area, a worse storm than the previous one. Uh, and this was uh, the middle of April, 1851. The night of, well, before I finish the story, I should mention that this drawing you see here uh, shows a rope from the top of the lighthouse down to a rock about 100 feet away. And you see the keeper riding in the basket there. Bennett installed that. Keeper Bennett installed that as he, he meant it to be an escape route in case of an emergency. Uh, it's my understanding they uh, did practice runs with it, but it was never actually used in, emer in an emergency. So anyway, so on the night of that big storm, April 16th, 1851, people on shore could see the flash of the light in the distance, and they could hear the fog bell. Uh, sometime after midnight, the fog bell started sounding like frantically, like over and over again. It could be that the keepers were signaling it like, that it was an emergency, or it could be that the tower was swaying back and forth and causing the bell to sound. In any case, the, soon there was no light, there was no sound. Keeper Bennett went to shore in the early morning to Cohasset and saw uh, pieces of the lighthouse washing up on shore, and he saw articles of his own clothing that had been out at the lighthouse washing on shore. Here's an artist's idea of what happened. The legs apparently snapped one at a time, and then the big, bigger central support snapped, and the whole thing went over. The two young keepers uh, apparently tried to swim for shore and died of exposure. Uh, one of them was found on a little island nearby. The other one was found on a beach in Cohasset eventually. Uh, so very sad story, obviously, and one of the more famous uh, lighthouse tragedies in history. That's the sad part of the story, but the the happy or kind of triumphant part of the story is that uh, an incredible new lighthouse was built. It took five years to build the, the new tower, the one that still stands. They started in 1855. Until this lighthouse was finished, there was a light ship station nearby. Of course, a light ship was like a floating lighthouse with the light, uh, one or two lights on it. There were uh, dozens of light ships uh, in the waters around the country. So there was a light ship temporarily here. The new lighthouse was built for about $300,000, which would be worth many millions in today's money. And this time they built it right. They built it of these uh, massive granite blocks, over a thousand and all. And they were dovetailed to each other, basically like puzzle pieces, like hooked into each other that made the tower much, much stronger. The granite came from Quincy Mass, from a quarry in Quincy. And uh, they would prepare the uh, blocks in Quincy and then bring them to uh, the shore in Cohasset. These are a couple of pictures showing that they would check to make sure everything fit together right before they brought it out to the uh, the ledge. And uh, so those are a couple of good pictures of the uh, preparing the blocks. And then they would bring them out to the ledge and they uh, used a, a like a, a schooner and uh, with a uh, hoist. Uh, and uh, they would kind of swing the blocks over to the... Uh, the the tower as it was assembled the workers on this job were required to be good swimmers 
It took five years to build the lighthouse, and in five years, not a single worker died or was seriously injured. They always had a lifeguard on duty, and there were a couple of close calls, but nobody died. It's pretty amazing. And, of course, you couldn't be afraid of heights either. This is in the days before hard hats. So uh, to me, it's absolutely amazing that nobody was seriously injured. So it was finished in 1860 and was regarded as kind of a miracle of lighthouse building. It's really one of the great uh, lighthouse uh, construction achievements in the world. It's an American civil engineering landmark uh, and uh, was re really quite celebrated when it went into service in 1860. Here's a newspaper article from a bit later. Uh, it was always just mail keepers living in the tower. The, the uh, families would live on shore. They built a couple of keeper's houses towards the upper left there. You, said, you see it says uh, Keeper's Cottages, Government Island. That was actually attached to the mainland. So the families would live there. They would always assign three or four keepers to the lighthouse. Two or no more than three at a time would be on duty, and the, they would rotate them. So they might get like three weeks on and a week off, things like that. They always had some uh, shore leave, but they were on the lighthouse more than they were off. Uh, in the upper right, you see the coal stove that was used for both cooking and heat. There was a pipe running up through the floors for heat. Very Spartan furnishings, as you can see on the lower right. But certainly much more comfortable and much safer than that first lighthouse. They said that when wa giant waves would hit this lighthouse, it sounded like thunder and it would shudder, like vibrate a little bit. But they never felt like the lighthouse was going to fall down. Jumping ahead to 1894... Minus Light got a very distinctive flash, and it's probably the most famous lighthouse flash in the world. Uh, the government was going to give every major lighthouse in the country a distinct numeric flash to make them easy to tell apart. They gave Minus a 143, meaning one flash, pause, four flashes, pause, three flashes. And uh, they gave one other lighthouse a numeric flash, but then they decided, well, that's too expensive. We're not going to do this. So Minus was one of only two that got this kind of a numeric flash. It didn't stand for anything, but people very quickly decided that the 143 stood for I love you, one for I and four for love and three for you. So it became known as the I love you light or the lover's light and uh, it became tradition for couples to uh, you know, look out at the, the lighthouse and do what couples do on shore and became tradition for men to propose to their sweeties on shore within view of Minus Light. And I, I believe they're still doing that today. So very, very famous flash. And here's Edward Rowe Snow again. I mentioned him a little while ago. Uh, he was an author who wrote over 40 books, many other shorter ones about maritime history, about shipwrecks and pirates and lighthouses and all kinds of cool maritime stuff, and mostly about the New England coast. He was also a, a great photographer, aerial photographer. He took this picture of Minots in, I think it was 1941. Uh, and he, had, he was a great storyteller. When I was growing up in Lynn, he was always on radio and TV in the Boston area. And I loved hearing his stories. I got to meet him a couple of times. His daughter's a good friend now. But I'm going to play you a brief audio clip of Edward Rowe Snow narrating a, narrating a cruise in Boston Harbor. And in this clip, he's talking about Boston Light. I just want you to hear his voice. So here it is. And now we have on our left of port side the oldest lighthouse in all America. Boston Light was lighted for the first time September 14, 1716, and we are approaching it on the left, on the north side. It is one of a group of 17 islands which make up the outer bay. So you just get an idea what a dramatic voice he had. He was a great storyteller. So in addition to all those other things, he also occasionally brought tours to Minot's Light, this is from, I believe it's from 1940. He brought a group of 100 people out to Minus Lighthouse. You see the guy in the fancy suit there going up the ladder. You're going to see women in dresses and more guys in fancy suits. That's Edward Rowe Snow in the white T-shirt helping people onto the ladder. That ladder goes up 65 feet to the doorway. In some of these shots, you'll see a Coast Guard keeper helping people in. It's absolutely amazing that he got away with this and that nobody was hurt. Uh you know, I'm sure this is the biggest group that ever went out to that lighthouse. I don't think it was done before or since. Uh, eventually, all 100 people got up to the top of the lighthouse. 
You know, the guys with the fancy suits with the hankies in the pocket and everything. Uh, I just, every time I see this, I just can't believe it. <laughs> so eventually, I'm not going to play the whole clip here. Eventually, all 100 people get up to the top there. But wait, there's more. He also on occasion would dive from the lighthouse from that door 65 feet up. On the left there, that's in the 1930s when he was young. But on his 60th birthday, he was out there with a group of people and he said, get your cameras ready. And here it is. This is on his 60th birthday in 1962. And you'll see him get up to the doorway there. And in a few seconds, you will see him. There he goes. And there's ledges all around that lighthouse. So he had to know where to land so he didn't hit the ledges. Uh, it's, uh, you know, he was he was quite a guy, in case you haven't gotten that idea already. His daughter, uh, Dolly, like I said, she's a good friend. She was 12 years old at this time. She was in the lighthouse just inside the door when he dove on that day. And she said, that's when I knew my father was crazy, <laughs> she told me. But she means that in a good way. He was, you know, he inspired people to get interested in maritime history. He he loved life for sure and a very inspirational kind of guy. Made had a big influence on me. This is the memorial established to those uh, two young keepers who died when the first Minot's light fell over. This is at Government Island in Cohasset on the waterfront. And uh, you see the tablet there established, uh, I think it was in the year 2000. And it says they kept a good light, which is the best thing you could say about lighthouse keepers. And that uh, memorial on the right, there's a Fresnel lens that was actually used out at Minot's Light for a while in that. And this is Graves Light in Outer Boston Harbor. I just added this today because I wanted to uh, give you a little bit extra about Massachusetts. This is uh, another uh, classic granite wave swept tower. This was built in 1905. Uh, it's a couple of miles north of Boston Light on the the, at the entrance to what's called the Broad Sound Channel into Boston Harbor. And it's a beautiful granite tower, uh, and it is now privately owned. It's one of the lighthouses that the government has auctioned in recent years. And the uh, owner is Dave Waller, the guy in the blue T-shirt on the left. He's with my friend, uh, retired Coast Guard Admiral Dan May there. I visited graves with Dan May in uh August. And that clip you that was just playing that video clip on the upper right, I'm going to go back and then back to it again. So it'll, there it is. That's, we were there on the day they were lifting some uh, parts, as you can see there, for a new lens that was being installed that's uh, hanging from a helicopter there. Dave Waller actually built a first order Fresnel lens from spare parts. He got pieces mostly from Australia he had a lot of help, but he put together this massive first order lens and the Coast Guard let him install it in the lantern room. And it's about to, I think in May, it's going to be officially relit as the aid to navigation, which is it's just an incredible story. Dave uh, bought the lighthouse about 10 years ago now, done an incredible restoration. That's one of the uh, rooms in the interior you see on the lower picture there. It is so beautiful in there. I saw it before restoration and he has worked miracles there. Thing that Whoops. I'm so thrilled. I forgot that I have an audio clip there. Let me play that again. Thing that I'm so thrilled about is how many hands have touched this place. And, you know, it's not fair to give us all the credit here because the, so many people, so many talented people have touched this place from all over New England and New York uh, in terms of glass makers and foundry casters and wood carvers and stonemasons and weavers and the list goes on and on and on and these are all not big companies these are small individual people or very very small companies and that's the way it was built the first time too so that's dave waller obviously the owner and uh, i can't say enough about the the work he's done out there i just want to talk for a couple of minutes about this uh, smaller wave swept tower out in, up in penobscot bay in maine mid-coast maine it's one what's called east penobscot bay if you know the geography up there it's east of vinyl haven island very big island west of isle of ho another big island so it's it's that way out in the ocean it's pretty much in the middle of nowhere it's a very barren ledge as you can see they built this granite tower uh in uh, 18 uh 40, 1839, yeah, 1839. It's 43 feet tall. It was designed by Alexander Paris, who was a very famous architect. It was built a lot better than most of our early lighthouses. The government, when they first built it, uh, decided that it would be a good idea to have a keeper living there with his family, which is uh, incredible to me. So this is a painting of the first keeper. 
His name was Watson Hopkins. This was that picture was sent to me by a descendant. And in 1843, he wrote a letter to Congress, and this is part of what he wrote. He mentioned that his salary was $450, which was per year. Well, it was more money then, but it was still a low salary. Uh, he lived in the in the inside the tower, the only building on the ledge. That that lower picture, that wooden building attached, was wasn't added until later. So he and his family lived in the tower. He had to travel seven miles, had to row a boat seven miles each way to get water for his family. It was just the harbor of uh, Stonington, Maine. My family consists of nine persons. He and his wife had six kids. His wife then had a baby in the lighthouse soon after they moved in. So they were living in a living room and two bedrooms in the tower, plus a cellar, a family of nine. Uh, and he talked about how uh, there had been a number of storms there. The railing on the rock was washed away. Also, the privy carried away the first storm after its erection. It's like adding insult to injury. The windows leak in storms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he went on. There was more than that. But anyway, um, you get the idea. The most amazing thing of all is that he and his family lived there for 10 years all year round. It just boggles my mind to think about that. Eventually, he bought a farm on Vinyl Haven Island. They finally left the island. I think what happened was uh, lighthouse keeper jobs were political appointments in those days. If you wanted a job at a comfortable station like, say, Portland Headlight in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, a beautiful station on the mainland with a big keeper's house, if you knew somebody in power, you had a chance of getting that job. But you had to support the right people <laughs> politically. Uh, in the case of Saddleback, I don't think there was anybody waiting for this job. I don't think there was a line <laughs> behind him waiting for it. So that's why he ended up staying there for 10 years. Nobody else wanted the job. This is a sort of a wave swept type tower at the entrance to the West Passage of Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. And it's a, in this case, it's what people sometimes call a spark plug type light, cast iron. This one was bolted to the rock there, whale rock. Uh, and I want to tell you, it was built in 1884. I want to tell you a story that happened here in 1897. Summer of 1897, there was a headkeeper named Judson Allen who had been in the lighthouse service for a number of years and an assistant named Henry Nigren who was fairly new to the lighthouse service. They had a running feud, and I don't know how it started, but one evening in August 1897, Judson Allen went up to light the light at sunset in his bare feet. I think it was a hot day. And as he's lighting the light, all of a sudden Henry Nigren charged up into the lantern room with a knife described as a butcher's knife he attacked alan they fought for the knife and uh alan knocked the knife out of nigren's hand the knife went bouncing down the stairs nigren went after it meanwhile alan lowered himself by rope down the side of the lighthouse was able to get a boat into the water started rowing for shore nigren grabbed a shotgun fired shots at alan uh, luckily missed him but he got the uh, station's other boat started rowing after alan Alan got, and I guess Nigren was screaming things at Alan. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to get you. Alan got to shore, still in his bare feet, ran until he got into a cornfield and hid. And uh, Nigren couldn't find him. So he went back to the lighthouse. The next day, two men went out to apprehend Nigren. And they uh, saw that he, they reported that he was dancing wildly at the top of the lighthouse and throwing plates and utensils off the top of the lighthouse. Uh, I think alcohol may have played a role in this whole incident. But anyway, they waited until the next day. They came out, and I think he was probably sleeping when they came back out, and they took him to shore. Uh, obviously, that was the end of his lighthouse keeping career, but I don't think he ever went to prison. You would have thought he would have, but I think they just told him to go away and don't come back. <laughs> So I just want to mention what happened to Whale Rock Lighthouse. This is a subject in itself I could talk a lot about, about other lighthouses that were just destroyed in storms. But Hurricane of 1938, the worst hurric re hurricane in recorded New England history, uh, totally un unexpected. Everybody thought it was going out to, sh out to sea. Uh, there was a lone uh, keeper at Whale Rock Lighthouse, Walter Eberly. You see him with his wife there. Uh, they had six kids. He was 40 years old, had just been in the lighthouse service for a year. Uh, the lighthouse was, as you see, knocked off its base. Eberly was never found. He was one of seven people who died at lighthouses in New England in that hurricane. The picture on the right is uh, a guy I've interviewed. 
uh, D uh, David Robinson, who was an underwater archaeologist. He's actually the uh, official underwater archaeologist for the state of Massachusetts today. But uh, quite a few years ago, he found the underwater remains of that lighthouse. It's kind of hard to make out, but he's looking at one of the plates of the lighthouse underwater there. And he was responsible for establishing a memorial to Walter Eberly uh, at Beaver Tail Lighthouse in Rhode Island. So, so let me move on here. This is my local wave swept lighthouse, Whale Backlight, which is near Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I'm here in Portsmouth, and this is just over the line in Kittery, Maine. It's the southernmost uh, of 66 lighthouses in Maine. It's another very well-built, 70-foot-tall uh, granite tower, and it takes a beating in storms. This is the second tower uh, there on that ledge. This one, again, built very well, uh, and it's it's held up through so, so many uh, terrible storms over the years. I took this picture on April 16, 2007, which is the anniversary of the Minot's Light Gale, and the basically waves will hit the rocks out there and just explode up more than 70 feet in the air over the lighthouse. And here's another picture in a storm, actually in a clear day with just an extremely high tide and rough seas in early March, 2018. So imagine living in that lighthouse through seas like this. But again, uh, they weren't really afraid of this lighthouse falling over. It was built so solidly. This is Jim Pope, who was one of the last Coast Guard keepers at Whaleback, 59 to 62, uh, as a very young man. I interviewed him a couple of years ago at the Kittery Historical Museum. That's a second order Fresnel lens from Boone Island Lighthouse behind him there. So I'm gonna play a, a short clip of uh, Jim Pope here. It would it'd be nice to have a little more room than walking around in a circle for, for four, three or four years. You know, like a, what was it? 16 feet, 18 feet at the most on the inside. And you was always climbing up and down, up and down. Everything it was up and down, 70 feet. But you did it. I did it. Well, it seems like you're, you're proud of the, that period. Hey, I've done things nobody will ever do in the world again. That's how I feel. How many guys can say they was a lighthouse keeper? How many guys can run a tugboat for 25 years? especially on this river. Yeah, as he said, he was a tug captain for 25 years after he left the Coast Guard. But Jim was a great guy. He passed away uh, a couple of years ago now. He loved to tell people he lived on spam sandwiches while he lived at Whaleback Lighthouse. He used to fish out his bedroom window at Whaleback. Only person I know who could say that, he would catch uh, Pollock out his window. So he had, a, he had a lot of great stories, just a great guy. So I want to talk for a few minutes about women lighthouse keepers. And there were uh, there were hundreds of women keepers in this country. Most keepers were men. There were thousands of male keepers, but there were quite a few women keepers as well. Uh, often what would happen is uh, you had a male keeper, often a wife and or daughter in the family would learn how to keep the light to do the job in case the man was incapacitated or died suddenly or was uh, detained while uh, away getting supplies or something. So uh, that, and often if the male keeper was then did die or was incapacitated, if there was already a person in the household who knew how to do the job, they often got the appointment. So that's how a lot of women got the job. One of the most famous women keepers was at this light station. This is Matinicus Rock off Midcoast, Maine, way out in Penobscot Bay. It was a twin light station. One of the lights, as you can see, with the light, the lantern was taken off and the tower was capped. So it's just a single light station now. Uh, in uh, 1852, 1853, 1853, uh, keeper Samuel Burgess moved to Matinicus Rock with his family. Uh, his daughter, Abby, from the time she was 13 years old, learned to take care of those two lights to help her father. Uh, in January 1856, when Abby was 16, her father went away to get supplies. He left Abby in charge. Not only was she in charge of the two lights, but her mother was an invalid and she had two younger siblings. So she had to take care of her mother, her younger sisters, and the two lights. Her father, when he left, said, keep the lights burning, Abby. I know I can count on you. Soon after he left, there was a tremendous storm. The island was just about underwater. This is part of a letter she wrote to a friend 
Uh, early in the day, as the tide arose, the she sea made a complete breach over the rock, washing every every movable thing away. As the tide came, the sea rose higher and higher to the only endurable places were the light towers. So uh, the house was flooded. She had to move her mother and sisters to the light tower, one of the light towers on higher ground. Uh, and then uh, she says. Uh, if they stood there, we were saved. Otherwise, our fate was only too certain. For some reason, I know not why. I had no misgivings. Went on with my work as usual. It's an amazing story. Uh, she kept the lights going that night through a snowstorm, going back and forth to the two lights. But not only that, uh, it went on for about three weeks. There was a series of storms and high tides before her father was able to return. And during that entire period, she kept those two lights burning every night, it was whale oil lamps at that time and uh, took care of her mother and younger sisters. So it's it's just a, an absolutely incredible story. Uh, and then, then the following year, she did virtually the same thing again. It kind of replayed itself. She was uh, regarded as a national heroine. She was written up in national publications. She married a lighthouse keeper, Isaac Grant. They eventually went to Whitehead Light in, uh, in Penobscot Bay. They had uh, several children. But she only lived to be 53. She died of uh, some sort of uh, brain disease. This is from a letter she wrote to a friend shortly before she died. She said, I wonder if the care of the lighthouse will follow my soul after it has left this worn out body. If I ever have a gravestone, I'd like it to be in the form of a lighthouse or beacon. All she got was this little gravestone you see there uh, until 1946 when Edward Rowe Snow, who's on the right here, and Wilbert Snow, uh, no relation, except maybe very distantly, but Wilbert Snow was a, a popular poet in Connecticut. Uh, they had this little aluminum lighthouse made, and they put it on her grave in a ceremony, so Abby got her lighthouse. Here's a picture I took a few years ago. So it's not exactly a big lighthouse, but it is a lighthouse, and I'm really happy to see that there. So uh, the most famous woman keeper, and probably the most famous lighthouse keeper in American history, period, was at Lime Rock Light in Newport Harbor, Rhode Island. Uh, and it's not much of a lighthouse. You see the uh, below the flag, directly below the flag, there's a light on the side of that building. That was the lighthouse. Uh, it's an inner harbor light, so it didn't need to be seen more than a couple of miles within the harbor. So they, they didn't have to build a tall lighthouse. So that was the keeper's house there. It's now a yacht club, and they put the decks on the outside there. But this is, this is Ida Lewis, who lived on that island for uh, 56 years. And uh, she went there as a 13-year-old girl, very similar story to Abby Burgess in a way. 13, when they first moved there, she learned how to take care of that light. Her father, Hosea Lewis, was the keeper. He had a stroke, couldn't do the job anymore. So from the time she was a, a teenager, I just started doing that job. She ended up uh, living there until uh, 1911 when she died. So basically, she was the keeper for, for well over 50 years, even though she didn't get the official job until she was about 40. She was known as a great handler of a dory. She was very strong. She wasn't very tall, but she was extremely strong. And during her years there, she was credited with rescuing at least 18 people from drowning. The number was probably quite a bit higher than that. It's believed that it was probably more than 30, but officially 18. Uh, on some occasions, she rescued soldiers from nearby Fort Adams who ended up in the water one way or another. In 1869, she did a particular rescue of uh, three soldiers from the fort and their boat overturned, she would typically go out in her boat and she would grab them by their collars, by their clothes, and pull them up into her boat. And you're talking about grown men wearing heavy winter clothing that would have been waterlogged. Just imagine how strong she was. So when she rescued those soldiers in 1869, she became really quite famous. She got on the cover of Harper's Weekly, as you see there, which was very very popular publication of its day. The people of Newport honored her in the 4th of July parade in uh, 1869. They gave her that fancy dory with mahogany seats and gold uh, oarlocks, and uh, they paraded her through the streets in the 4th of July parade. She hated every minute of all that. She was very modest and quiet. She just basically wanted to be left alone. President Ulysses S. Grant went out to visit her. Uh, some of the suffragists of the day, I believe Susan B. Anthony, uh, visited her, and she said that those visits were more stressful than her uh, than her rescues had been. So she did not like all that attention at all. Uh, she passed away in 1911 at the age of 69. It was big national news when she died. 
Uh, she had a large funeral attended by all the lighthouse keepers in the region. Uh, and after she died, they actually renamed the light station Ida Lewis Light. It's the only case in American history that I know where that's happened. And eventually it became the Ida Lewis Yacht Club. The light isn't needed for navigation anymore, but they light it on summer nights as a tribute to her. And I'm getting towards the end here. I just want to say a little bit more about uh, Fresnel lenses. There's a beautiful, you can't tell how tall it is in this picture, but that's about nine feet tall. That's a first order Fresnel lens that's on display at the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester. And that was used in one of those beautiful tall granite towers at Thatcher Island at one time. And this is, I think, the most beautiful lens I've ever seen. This is at Umco River Light in Oregon. I did a West Coast trip a few years ago. And this is a rotating lens. This is looking up from underneath the lens up into it. As it rotates, it creates an alternating red and white flash. You see the clear panels alternating with the red panels. And I just think it's absolutely gorgeous. That ruby red glass is so, so pretty. Uh, and here is a first order, the only first order lens in northern New England. That's Seguin Light at the mouth of the Kennebec River in Maine. This one is a fixed light. It doesn't rotate, so it doesn't have those round panels on it, but it's still a gorgeous lens. And here's Boston. Whoops, let me go back to that. This is a, yeah, why isn't that playing? Let me try that again. There it is. That's a video clip of the light of Boston. That's the same lens you saw in earlier pictures, uh, several pictures I showed already of that rotating third order I'm sorry, second order, second order Fresnel lens at Boston Light. I call these uh, uh, functional works of art. <laughs> uh, they're obviously uh, created to serve a function to pr produce a navigational light, but they're, uh, the, to me, they're also works of art. They're absolutely gorgeous. So when I got to spend a night at Boston Light, I took some pictures uh, late at night, including the one you see there on the screen. And these are some of the types of optics that have replaced a lot of the Fresnel lenses. Today, approximately 10% of our lighthouses still have their classical Fresnel lenses. Most of the offshore lights now have LEDs, solar-powered LEDs. That is a, an LED light on the far right. That is at the Isles of Shoals Lighthouse off the New Hampshire coast. They can have from one to 10 of those rings, depending on how bright they want the light to be. Uh, this one has, what is it, eight rings. Or is it three, six? Yeah, I think it's eight rings. Um, the one on the far left is a rotating arrow beacon kind of light, or DCB, that replaced a lot of the Fresnel lenses uh, years ago, uh, similar to lights used at airports. But most of those have been phased out. There are very few still in use. They're not being made anymore, and parts are hard to find. So those are phased out. That's a VRB25 in the middle, a rotating uh, acrylic optic made by the Vega Company in New Zealand uh, that were used at a lot of lighthouses. But a lot of those have been phased out by the, uh, the LED lights today. The LEDs, they don't rotate. They just flash. They have a flasher in them. Uh, like a computerized flasher, uh, and uh, they serve the purpose. The light's uh, seen as far as it needs to be seen. It's a colder, bluish kind of light than the old lights, uh, and uh, a lot of people think they don't have the romance of the old rotating lights, but they still do the job for a lot less money and a lot less attention from the Coast Guard. This is my home base, Portsmouth Harbor Light, about 15 minutes from my home here, right next to Portsmouth in Newcastle, New Hampshire. It's on a Coast Guard station. You see the Coast Guard building in the background there. It's right by uh, the walls of Fort Constitution, a very historical fort. You've got the old keeper's house on the other side of the, the fort wall there. This is the third lighthouse built there. This one uh, was built in 1878. First lighthouse was 1771, was the first lighthouse north of Boston. The last keeper at Portsmouth Harbor Light was this guy, Elson Small, came in 1946 with his wife, Connie. After 26 years of living on islands off the main coast, they were pretty thrilled to live at a lighthouse on the mainland, although Newcastle is technically an island connected by bridges to the mainland. But they were thrilled to live there because they could drive to their home for the first time. It was also the first place that had electricity. I was lucky enough to know Connie late in her life. Uh, she lived to be 103. She passed away in 2005 uh, at 103. And I interviewed her when she was 96 years old. I'm going to play you a short clip here of Connie talking about having electricity for the first time. Uh, and she and her husband have been looking forward to it, but it was sort of a letdown at the same time. So let me play this clip. 
We always look forward to electricity, of course, and the first electricity was when we came to Portsmouth Harbour. Mm -hmm. And of course he said, well, we'll go up and light the, the light. So we went up and finally he said, press the button, and I pressed the <laughs> button, and I no no more feeling, and I've got to vote it right now. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what has happened? What is the reason? Mm -hmm. So I went down to the kitchen, sat down, and began to think about it. What in the world, why wasn't I, when we look forward to it as a big thing? Then I realized we had to give 20 minutes of ourselves to light that light. Mm -hmm. And we had put part of us into it. And that made it something. But just to press a button, that was nothing. <laughs> you see what I mean? And so that's my first, but when I went back and went in the house and saw what I could do, we went on an electric binge and <laughs> bought everything we could electric. So I just like sharing clips of Connie, but also it kind of illustrates a point. She, uh, you know, uh, as, like she said, it was kind of a letdown. It wasn't the same anymore once they could just flick a switch or push a button to make that light come on. Uh, as we make progress with technology, I think we often lose things along the way with lighthouses, obviously, with electrification and automation. We lost having resident keepers living at these places and taking care of them on a daily basis, which is why we have preservation organizations today. Uh, one of I work for the U.S. Lighthouse Society, uh, which is based on the West Coast, although I'm on the East Coast. And uh, for uh, 10 years, I was the president of the American Lighthouse Foundation, which is based in Maine. And I founded the local chapter here, Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses, over 20 years ago. We take care of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, also Whaleback Lighthouse. And for years, we had open houses at Portsmouth Harbor Light. Uh, in the lower right, that's one of our volunteers, Ruth Knowles, giving a tour. We used to have uh, open houses every Sunday. Then with COVID, we went a year with no tours. Then we went to having them just by appointment only. But then uh, in... Uh, December, two days before Christmas, 2022, there was a, a storm. I'm going to play you a video clip that was sent to me by one of the Coast Guardsmen on the station there, taken during the storm. It pans over to the lighthouse. You see how flooded the area around the keeper's house is there. That's, that's a few feet of water there in that area, like halfway up the door that leads into the basement there. And I was home recovering from a foot operation, and I got this video sent to me. And I'm looking at it. When it just goes by the lighthouse quickly, I thought, something's wrong with this picture. And it turned out that there was something very wrong with it. Uh, most of the 80-foot footbridge or walkway that led out to the lighthouse was gone after that storm. Uh, and you, see, you can see it in these two pictures. On the left, that's my friend's uh, Michelle Shaw, the, who's now the chairperson of the group. And my friend Bob Trapani, who's the executive director of the America Lighthouse Foundation down below, looking at what happened on the right, that's a picture from the top of the lighthouse showing how the uh, most of the walkway was washed out to sea. We never saw it again. Uh, so uh, the Coast Guard owns all this. The Coast Guard told us they would rebuild the walkway uh, over well over a year later. They have not, but that was probably a good thing because we had two storms in January where uh, the station was flooded again, as you see here, January 10th and 13th, especially the 13th was the worst of the two. And uh, the lighthouse was severely affected. And here are two pictures after that storm. That's a couple of days after the storm. That's Michelle again, uh, and me in the middle standing there, and Bob Trapani again on the right. You see the base of the lighthouse, which dates to 1804 from the previous lighthouse, was really torn apart by that storm. It had been there for well over 200 years and had never sustained damage like this. So pretty incredible. Uh, and the oil house on the rocks nearby, which is where they used to store kerosene for the light, was pretty well wrecked, as you can see there. And remains to be seen whether we can save that. But we're trying to – the Coast Guard may be repairing the lighthouse. We haven't gotten word yet. We've been trying to get word. Uh, we're having a, we've had a contractor look on at it. We're getting uh, estimates if we have to do the work. So one way or another, we're uh, determined that it'll get repaired. Uh, this is uh, my podcast again, uh, Lighthearted for the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Two words. If you have a podcast app, you can search for Lighthearted. 
uh, or you can go to news.uslhs.org. I've done almost 300 episodes of the podcast in almost five years, and I've had a ball doing it, interviewing people connected to lighthouses all over the world. It's just a lot of fun. And here's uh, kind of a bibliography or suggested sources uh, and uh, some websites, including my website, New England Lighthouses, a virtual guide, uh, which has history of every lighthouse in New England, newenglandlighthouses.net, American Lighthouse Foundation, Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses, U.S. Lighthouse Society. Check out uslhs.org. There's a lot on there, including the tours. I'll be running a main tour in October for a week, uh, and uh, there's still room on that. Uh, so there's, and we do, uh, I host uh, regular Zoom events for the society and so forth, uh, similar to what we're doing right now. Flying Santa, I'm not going to go into detail on that, but it's, it relates to lighthouses. It's a fascinating history. Go to flyingsanta.org if you want to read about that and some books I recommend. So uh, I'm going to come out of screen sharing. I have a couple of video clips I could play if we have time, but I think we want to take questions for a few minutes. So let me... Let me come out of screen sharing. All right, here I am. Okay. <laughs> hey, and... Jeremy. As Hi. always, that was amazing. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think we're going to have to go uh, for people that are still here. And we have quite a few um, until 830, if that's okay, to get sure. to a few questions. Um, yep. So Andrea asks, um, I thought I read recently about a job running a lighthouse somewhere in New England. The current lighthouse keepers are moving on. Is this true? Well, again, there are no traditional lighthouse keepers anymore. So I'm not sure which lighthouse you'd be talking about in New England. There are some lighthouses, Seguin Island being one of them, Thatcher Island being another, where the organizations hire seasonal caretakers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, some of them might only do like a, a month or two and then have other characters. There'll be people out there for the summer. Uh, so uh, those are two that I can tell you you might want to look into if you're interested in something like that. Thatcher Island, Ma Massachusetts, Seguin Island, Maine, but around the country, there are other lighthouses that have similar programs. Mm -hmm. Those are the two that comes to come to mind within New England. So I'm not sure if that's what she's talking about or it might be something else I'm not thinking of. But again, there are no no real lighthouse keepers anymore. It's more like caretaker positions and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, talking about Seguin, um, have you heard that people can apply to live there in the summer? Is that what you're talking about? The, the caretakers yes. allow that? Okay. Yes. Great. Because I am going to do that. <laughs> oh, okay. Might be too late to get in for this year, but. Uh, hey, I'm around. Year. Okay. It's a fantastic place. I love it there. Yeah. Um, when families lived on the island with the lighthouses, what was the source of energy for heat and cooking and et cetera? Um, it was coal for a really long time. Uh, they uh, would have coal delivered at a lot of these places. Excuse me. They had uh, lighthouse tenders, these boats that would deliver supplies and guys would carry sacks of coal, you know, to the houses. So they went through a lot of coal at these places. Also for the steam operated foghorns, which they had at a lot of places for many years, they used burned coal as well. Mm -hmm. So they went through tons of coal a year. Mm -hmm. So, was, and uh, I think I, I might've mentioned a picture in mine, it's light, a coal stove that was used for both heating and, and cooking. Mm -hmm. That was pretty typical. Uh, so coal would have been the main fuel for, for that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, could you, this is interesting because, um, Jeremy's going to do a talk with us in October on haunted lighthouses. Even so, more haunted lighthouses is going to no, be this it's one. It's the yeah. third one. So yeah. it's more, even more. <laughs> yeah. Um, so somebody says, could you please speak to how the rumors of the ghost assistant light keepers at Minnow's light started? Yeah. Um, Mine, I think I talked about Minots in one of the previous talks I did on Haunted Lighthouses for you, but uh, basically the, the usual story you hear is that I talked about those two keepers who died, Joseph Wilson and Joseph Antoine. The usual story you hear is that Joseph Antoine, I should mention that a descendant of his emailed me and said, no, it's pronounced Antone, but it's spelled Antoine, so I'm not sure about that. But anyway, that he, they say that people in storms will be near the lighthouse and they'll see a figure on the ladder like waving them away and yelling in Portuguese, which he was, stay away. I don't know how you say it in Portuguese, but that's what he's supposed to be yelling. I can't vouch for that, but that's the the usual story you hear. There's, there's another story, one of the keepers at mine, it's hearing rapping on the pipe that ran between walls and nobody, the other keeper swore that he didn't do it. And they figured that they they found out that the early keepers would rap on the 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 pipe to communicate with each other. So... 
not sure what they were hearing. But well, anyway. we know that you've seen ghosts at lighthouses, so everybody stay, t- stay tuned for October. <laughs> um, Norman asked, what is a first order, second order of lenses? What does that mean? Yeah, first, uh, it refers to the sizes. Uh, and of course, lar- the larger the lens, the more powerful, the farther out to see the light would be seen. So first order was the largest and most powerful. The lenses were like nine feet tall, but they'd be on pedestals that made them even higher. Um, set then down to sixth order being very small, used in a small like river light or something like that. Mm-hmm. A lot of the most, most common size was fourth order, which would be about well, you can't see my hands, but about three feet tall, approximately, um, used in a lot of harbor lights, you know, entrances to harbors and things like that. Very common, fourth order. A fourth order lens, like at Portsmouth Harbor Light, the light is seen approximately 15 miles out to sea, but the most powerful lights they'd be seen as far as like 27 miles. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, Lois asks, how were the heights of the lighthouses determined? It depended on the purpose of the light and also the terrain. So like um, down in like the Car- North Carolina, you've got some famous lighthouses, the Outer Banks, Cape Hatteras and some others. Cape Hatteras is two lighthouses, 200 feet tall. Those are low beaches there. They wanted the light to be seen way, uh, you know, far away, uh, more than 20 miles. And it's also on a very low lying beach. So they made a very tall lighthouse. In New England, a lot of them are on bluffs. You know, they're high up off the water. Lighthouse like Owl's Head in Penobscot Bay, the bluff is 100 feet high, so it's just a short little brick lighthouse on top of that. So it's a combination of the purpose of the light, how far they needed the light to be seen, combined with uh, the terrain, how high up off the water it was. I hope that makes sense. Totally makes sense to me. Yolanda asks, where in the world would you say has the most concentration of lighthouses? Um, Well, the U.S. has the most lighthouses of any country. Canada being second with about 700. Uh, there are some con- smaller countries that have a pretty big, you know, pretty big concentration of lighthouses in a, uh, with shorter coastlines. So I'm not sure of the exact answer to that question. I'll tell you that the Great Lakes have a pretty incredible concentration of lighthouses. There are more than 400 lighthouses on the Great Lakes be- divided between the U.S. and Canada. People don't, don't think about that, but those are inland oceans, basically, and... Uh, you know, a lot of important waterways. So uh, that's well, a pretty, pretty thick concentration of lighthouses there. But New England, they're pretty clustered in New England. You know, we have a, a great selection of lighthouses here. Yeah. I was going to say that despite their lighthouses, the Edmund Fitzgerald still sank. Indeed, I mean, it did. It's a yeah. song. It had to, it happened. <laughs> so really Marianne did. says, Brant Point Lighthouse in Nantucket is a favorite. It is the second oldest lighthouse. Do you have a story to share about this lighthouse? Uh, interestingly, yeah, the original lighthouse there was built in 1746 in the days when Nantucket was the we- leading whaling port in the world. But that light has been rebuilt 10 times. So the little lighthouse that's there today is from 1901. Uh, and it's been built and rebuilt more times than any lighthouse in the country. 10 different structures have stood there at Brand Point at the entrance to Nantucket Harbor. Uh, so that's an interesting story about it. Um, uh, a couple of them burned down. I think one was destroyed by a tornado. <laughs> uh, Nantucket obviously has a tremendous history. As far as that, other than what I just said, I'm not sure I can give you any stories about the lighthouse itself. Yeah. Um, Nancy has a comment, and I have a question about it. Do you know about Barnegat Light in New Jersey? We stayed there overnight one time, but then learned that it had been sold to a private person or something. Wish I could have purchased it. No, um, Barnegat's not owned by a private. It's um trying to think it's uh it's owned by the city i believe it's actually the city of barnegat light i believe it is um it's funny you mention it because i have not been there before but i'm doing a new jersey trip in may and i'm going to see all the lighthouses there and i'm interviewing somebody there um right. no it's not privately owned a lot of lighthouses have been sold into private ownership but that that's not one of them um is there like so a far. website for like when lighthouses go on sale because i would like to buy one <laughs> <laughs> Well, good luck with that. I'll tell you the Graves Light went for just about a million dollars, which, yeah, they don't all go that high, but they're probably going to go at least a couple of hundred thousand when they're sold by the government. Mm-hmm. Um, GSA sells them. So if you go to uh, the General Services Administration website, I think it's GSA, gsa.gov, you can search for Lighthouse to see if there's any lighthouses currently up for sale. What happens is there's a program where they they turn them over to nonprofits or whatever. If they don't get any good applications, they auction them to the general public. That's how Graveslight Minutes was also auctioned. Um, 
I don't think there's any currently up for auction that I'm I can think of that I'm aware of off the top of my head. But they do. Th there will be some more auctioned. There, okay. most have already been spoken for, but there'll be more. So keep your eyes open. Well, I'm gonna have to win the lottery because my librarian salary won't. <laughs> well, might buy me a lighthouse. <laughs> yeah. Well, whether I had, I don't have the money, but even if I did, my wife would kill me if I if I bought a lighthouse. So. I'm pretty sure I would have that same issue, not with your wife, but with my husband. Um, somebody says, I think the cuckolds in Maine were once privately owned. Cuckolds, uh, under that the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, went to a nonprofit uh, a number of years ago, and they ran it as a B and B, a luxury B and B, for some years, but that effort seems to have not it's not happening anymore so um i think there are some local people looking after it but it's still it's kind of in limbo basically at this point it may revert to the government i'm not sure but it, it never went to private ownership it went to a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um last question uh because it's almost 8 30 is where's the best place for us to know where your talks are happening on my website uh newenglandlighthouses.net I have a page on my lectures, my lecture schedule, and I do have a few more this year. Um, most are in New Hampshire. I live in Portsmouth, and I do a lot of talks for through New Hampshire Humanities. They actually sponsor talks at libraries and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have, I think I have another one coming up in a couple of weeks, and then there's no more until the fall. People don't tend to book them in the summer so I'll much. Remember that because you'll have more time. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, so I will put that link in my recap email to everybody uh, with the video link. And um, Jeremy, this has been fantastic as always. Um, learn so much, and people really stay. They really are learning so much. And I saw that. I'm always <laughs> relieved when I do this because I can't see anybody while I'm talking. So when I come back, I'm afraid nobody's going to be there. So I'm always relieved. That people... <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for for hanging in there and listening. Even I went off to get a snack, but that, you know, I was listening <laughs> to you. So, but it's always fascinating and um, we're looking forward to our October one. And um, we also just appreciate the knowledge that you share with us every single time. So. Well, it's my pleasure. And I appreciate being asked back uh, so many times. So thank you so much. Nina. Oh, you are on my, you know, to be called list. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody have a good night and I hope you get to a lighthouse soon. <laughs> Good night. Good night.